Hi students, welcome to HSC Science Extension and module one, the foundations of scientific thinking. This is video number two and we're going to explore empiricism and scientific inquiry. So for this video, we're going to be trying to describe the influence of empiricism on scientific inquiry. In order to do this, I'm going to break this video up into three little sections and some of these are obviously activities that we're going to look at more deeply during class. But I want to look at what empiricism is and how important experiments are in science, at rationalism as a contrast to empiricism and whether or not science can progress without direct observations. And so, of course, that brings us to the limits of observation and this clash between empiricism and rationalism in science and how we resolve that. And that's where we're going in this particular video. So the first thing that we need to be aware of is empiricism is derived from a Greek term, which basically means experience and experience basically that is linked to observation. So uh, one important definition, I think, uh, in certainly in relation to the link between science and empiricism is that scientific thinking and investigation have the same pattern as everyday thinking and investigation. In each case, the only source of knowledge about the world is experience. But science is especially successful because it is organized, systematic, and particularly responsive to experience. This view of empiricism um, has had some very strong adherence over the years. And whilst now I guess we're in a position where we can look back at some of the history of the development of science and how it, very important experiments have changed our understanding uh, of scientific concepts and principles, we also know that experimentation may not be the only way in which science can progress. And that's why we're going to look at it in a little bit of detail in this video. Philosophy is an ancient practice and it refers to the love of wisdom. Many of the ancient Greeks are famous today as philosophers who sought this kind of wisdom. And a special group that sought to make sense of the natural world, we referred to as natural philosophers. Around the 15th century, there was a change in the way that natural philosophers defined how knowledge of the natural world should be constructed. And this really was the beginning of science as a separate discipline. But it was left until the 19th century where we've credited the British philosopher William Wewell as the first to coin the term science, which described the types of inquiries undertaken by natural philosophers. Eventually, the term science became distinct from many other branches of inquiry, including philosophy, religion, and so on. Philosophically, empiricism is based on the principle of a posteriori. According to this principle, knowledge and concepts are derived from prior evidence. For example, the statement, it is raining now, is an a posteriori statement because it's based on the observation or evidence, if you like, that rain is actually falling. So are statements such as, I passed my test. Water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. All of these statements are supported by prior information. For this reason, observations are important for knowledge construction. The information collected through observation eventually becomes evidence and explanations for natural phenomena. Over time, the evidence and explanations become scientific knowledge. One of the ways of understanding empiricism is to look at an important historic example. And what's really interesting when we look at the work of Galileo is he has a nice juxtaposition of both the use of empiricism or observation and evidence through experimentation to support some of his ideas, as well as some very important um, thought experiments and ideas that he had where he didn't have the evidence to support them at the time. Galileo set science apart from philosophy through observation and experiment. One of the things that he wrote in his book 1623 was that ex if experiments are performed thousands of times at all seasons and in every place without once producing the effects mentioned by your philosophers, poets and historians, this will mean nothing and we must believe their words rather than our own eyes. This was a question that Galileo had in terms of the importance of experimental work, especially when it conflicted with some of the ideas of the natural philosophers. Aristotle and Ptolemy's geocentric model of the solar system in particular was a concern to Galileo. He took out a telescope and trained it on heavenly bodies and systematically collected data on the moons and the planets of the solar system. He noticed that Jupiter's moons circled 
the planet. This contradicted the geocentric model of the solar system, where planets, moons, and stars all orbited a fixed Earth. Later, Galileo observed the phases of Venus, much like the phases of our moon. Aristotle had rejected the heliocentric model because Venus's brightness would always be the same. That is, according to Aristotle, Venus would be fainter when it was on the far side of the sun relative to the Earth and brighter when it was on the near side. But Aristotle did not know about the phases of Venus. He had no way of being able to observe that Venus actually had phases. What the figure shows is the phases of Venus as we view them from the Earth. Galileo explained that the phases of Venus were caused by its orbit of the sun, much the same way as we explain the phases of our moon. Geocentric models cannot explain this observation. There's no way you can have phases of Venus if Venus is orbiting the Earth and the Sun is also orbiting the Earth. So Galileo concluded that Venus and all the other planets must orbit the Sun, just as the moon of Jupiter orbited the planet. Galileo surmised that Copernicus's heliocentric model, where the Sun is the center of the solar system, is the correct model. A contrast to the empirical model of scientific inquiry is rationalism. In rationalism, we need to understand the importance of reason and intuition. We need to contrast a priori statements with a posteriori statements, and we need to understand the language of science. Rationalism is the theory that reason rather than experience is the foundation of scientific knowledge. In other words, knowledge can only be constructed from reasoning and intuition. Rationalism is the opposing school of thought to empiricism. Rationalism is based on the principle of an a priori reasoning. A priori means from earlier. A posteriori is from later. So from earlier refers to the method of reasoning where conclusions are reached before evidence is obtained for those conclusions. Reasoning and logical thought are the foundations of an a priori principle. So some kind of simple statements to get an idea of the sorts of things that might be a priori statements could be the following. All bachelors are unmarried. Cubes have six sides. Today is Friday. Red is a color. Seven plus five equals 12. Each of these propositions is developed from definitions rather than observations. For example, one of the ways we define cubes is by the number of sides and the shape of those sides, particularly in relation to one another. Bachelors are defined as unmarried males. So therefore, our definitions have already presupposed these particular statements, these propositions. We don't need to gather evidence in order to support these statements. And we certainly haven't given, gathered evidence prior to making these statements. They are part of the definitions that we've provided. When we look at historical rationalism, there are a couple of very important uh, observations that we can make. Thought experiments are typical examples of rationalism in science. In thought experiments, scientists develop their ideas from first principles without necessarily conducting physical experiments. They rely on logic, rational reasoning, a vivid imagination, and a deep understanding of established principles to derive scientific explanations. They may also use significant or at least rely significantly on mathematics in order to prove the case. One example is Galileo's disproving of the Aristotelian view that heavy objects fall to the earth more quickly than lighter objects with a thought experiment. In his book, Discourse Concerning Two Sciences, Galileo wrote the following. Let me once more explain that the variation of speed observed in bodies of different specific gravities is not caused by the difference of a specific gravity, but depends upon external circumstances, and in particular, upon the resistance of the medium. So that if this is removed, all bodies would fall with the same velocity. This result I deduce mainly from the fact which you have just admitted, and which is very true, namely, that in the case of bodies which differ widely in their weight, their velocities differ more and more as the spaces traversed increase, something which would not occur if the effect depended upon differences of specific gravity. Now, Galileo was dropping objects from the Tower of Pisa, but he wasn't able to remove things like air resistance. And whilst his experimental evidence was compelling, it wasn't until much later 
when we carried out experiments on the moon in the absence of air, that we actually found some of these ideas of Galileo to be correct, to actually have an empirical base to them. Prior to that, we just had those thought experiments that still made sense, that still gave us this understanding of how objects fall under the influence of a force like gravity. Galileo's use of thought experiments showed that besides experimental science, he also valued logical reasoning. Einstein developed the theory of special relativity from a thought experiment about running alongside a photon of light, while a theory of general relativity was developed from imagining a man in a falling lift. Heisenberg's quantum mechanics Schrodinger's wave equation and his famous cat thought experiment are all examples of rationalistic thinking that produce significant advances in science. In each of these instances, the scientists didn't conduct any experiment to obtain data and to develop or support their ideas. They used rigorous mathematics in their work. Mathematics surpassed mechanism. Rationalism and a priori are the bases for deduction, a reasoning tool in science, and something that we're going to look at in contrast to induction in our next video. Empiricism was crucial for separation of natural philosophy from the other branches of philosophy. It came to define modern science. Most scientific knowledge is empirical. Empiricism demands that all scientific information be based on evidence and tested through observation or experimentation. However, there are limits to empiricism and these often were identified by the rationalists. To sum up, and I guess to try and give you some stimulus for thinking as we explore this in a little bit more detail in class, there's a nice quote from our Philosophy of Science book that we're going to be um, focusing some of our attention on as we work through this first module. Applied to science, the empiricist doctrine becomes the view that the limits to scientific knowledge are set by our powers of observation. So science can give us knowledge of fossils or trees or sugar crystals, but not of atoms, electrons and quarks. Thanks for watching.